Hey guys, we're here with Jason Silver. Jason, good to see you, man. Hey, good to see you. Thanks for having me. That's cool. Thanks for coming along. It's a pleasure. So you were at Tech Ed in That's Queensland right. last week. You're here for the Festival of Dangerous Ideas in Sydney this week. It's over at the Opera House over there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So basically what we've got you along to talk about today is the singularity. Mate, what is the singularity? Well, you know, what I love about the singularity idea is that if it's kind of taken off as its own meme and it's spreading from brain to brain and people have all these different ideas and interpretations about what it implies. But the definition that I go by is uh, the one that I got from reading Ray Kurzweil's famous book, The Singularity is Near When Humans Transcend Biology. Basically, the singularity is a metaphor that's borrowed from a physics term that describes what happens when you go through a black hole. Okay. Namely, all the laws of physics as we know them don't no longer apply when you go through a black hole. So he's saying basically this, this, this metaphor for transformation, this metaphor for we don't know what happens next, it's being used to describe basically the trajectory that we're heading at in terms of how the, the rate of change of information technology. And uh, basically information technology is evolving or rather it's, it's moving at an exponential rate. And this runs counterintuitive to the linear and local way in which our brains make extrapolations about change. Okay. And, you know, if you take, Kurzweil uses this example, if you take 30 linear steps, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 30 steps later, you're at 30. If you take those same 30 exponential steps, same steps, but exponentially, 2, 4, 8, 16, 30 steps later, you're at a billion. And that's the rate of change of information technology. So what happens, there's a great quote that says there are... There are decades where nothing happens, and then there are weeks when decades happen. And what we're moving towards is this future where increasingly, over the course of weeks and months, we're going to make hundreds of years worth of progress. It's this notion that if you look at your average smartphone today, it's a million times cheaper, a million times smaller, a thousand times more powerful than a $60 million supercomputer that was half a building 40 years ago. And so when we're making progress like this, what used to be half a building now fits in your pocket. What currently fits in your pocket will soon fit inside your blood cells. So we're talking about supercomputers that are trillions of times more powerful than the average smartphone we have today going inside of our bodies, our, our bodies and uh, interfacing with our biology. So we're talking about a merger of biology and computation. We're talking about a mastering of the information processes of biology, reverse engineering, aging, curing all of our diseases, having... I mean, all sorts of what Freeman Dyson calls a new future where a new generation of artists will be writing genomes the way that Blake and Byron used to write verses. So when, when biology becomes the canvas for the artist, when we get to play with the canvas of life the way we currently play with software, the overlapping revolutions in biotech with uh, information technology with nanotech, which is to manipulate matter at the level of the atom, and then AI, artificial intelligence, all these three revolutions overlapping over on top of each other lead us towards this event horizon sooner than we than we actually think right yeah. in the next 25 30 years so he calls it a singularity as a way of saying look we're about to cross a threshold and everything is going to change it's going to change even more than the world changed when we invented language a hundred thousand years ago i mean the world post language would have been inconceivable to early hominids on the other side of that line a world of skyscrapers, of jet engines, of agriculture, of progress, of poetry, of rich inner thinking. You know, this world, post-language, would have been inconceivable pre-language, and so too with the singularity. What comes after those three overlapping revolutions? Impossible to fathom. And so that's where the metaphor comes from. And sorry to, to rant no, about well, it, well, let's, I think it's Let's totally stop amazing. down right there. Let's talk about the ethics of this. Obviously, we're accelerating this at a huge rate, like you wouldn't believe. Yeah. So what I'm wondering is... We see all these Hollywood movies where robots rise up to kill us all, and, yeah. and it's awful. But what I want to know is, is what, are, what are the ethics? What are the ethics of doing this? Like, should scientists be working on cramming, you know, the human mind inside a microchip yeah. so that yeah. it can think for itself? Yeah. Well, I think there's always going to be concern when it comes to disruptive change, and you know, the role of technology is to act as kind of as a kind of scaffolding that extends our thought, reach, and vision. Technology is our exoskeleton. It's our extended phenotype. It's a part of who and what we are, and it extends our reach beyond our usual boundaries. Every new technology extends our reach a little bit more, right? However, that reach can be extended in any direction, in a good direction and a bad direction. I mean, even the guy that discovered fire was probably burned at the stake by his own contemporaries. You can use perhaps the greatest information technology, that of the alphabet, to compose Shakespearean sonnets that enrich our inner world, or to compose like hate speech propaganda. So you can do both with the technology of even the alphabet. So there's so always a, a fear. A well, any technology that offers a form of augmentation of the human condition 
is going to be sort of frightening in some ways because we could use that in negative ways. Mm -hmm. People could use synthetic biology to create new pathogens that could destroy human beings in huge numbers, and that's terrifying. But we could also use synthetic biology to redefine what it is to be human, to turn ourselves into a work of art. And, and, and you know, inevitably the genie's out of the bottle. Progress moves inexorably towards complexity, right? We have this complexity bootstrapping on its own complexity. We have technology bootstrapping on itself. And, and it's like, it's not a matter of if at this point, it's, it's just a matter of whether we can steer mm. this, this secondary force of evolution called technology that seems to like be the next leap. You know, as Terence McKenna says, from the moment that we invented language, biological evolution stopped being relevant. Evolution became this cultural epigenetic phenomenon. We went from genes to memes. And even though memes are not made of nucleic acid, memes are not made of DNA, these memes, these ideas have changed the world and have achieved more evolutionary change at a rate that leaves the old gene panting far behind, to quote uh, my own video, actually. But this idea, I mean, I think it blows my mind. But yes, sorry about the train. Um, Yes, look, change, disruption, frightening. When we first figured out how to write things down, the intellectuals at the time used to say, it'll rot your brain. Yeah. If you write things down, it's going to rot your brain. You're not remember. People are always afraid of new technology. But I recommend people check out Stephen Johnson's book, Everything Bad is Good for You. In the end, we assimilate these technologies. They end up being not all that scary. And look, we're still here. Yeah. And the world has been getting better. I mean, look at the world. Look at the work of Matt Ridley. Look at the, world, the work of Stephen Pinker, the myth of violence. I mean, in spite of all the paranoia, the world is safer. The world is less violent than ever before. It's also more connected. We're aware of the bad, but there's less bad than there's ever been. And I think that's reason to be optimistic that, you know, in the end, of the, at the end of the day, we'll do we'll do fine. So final question. You mentioned yeah. uh, you mentioned assimilation. Yeah. You mentioned uh, man and machine. Yeah. Basically, what I'm wondering is, can we ever put the technology from this into this? Well, I think it's inevitable, right? And I think there's, there's an interesting uh, idea put out there by Andy Clark. He's a cognitive philosopher that he says we need to get over what he calls our skin bag bias, mm. which is this bias that says that anything that's within our tissue is somehow us and somehow natural, and anything that's beyond our tissue is somehow separate from us. And he says that really we're, that, that he talks about this idea that minds are actually uh, constructed out of the feedback loops between brains, tools, and their environments. Mm. And so, you know, he talks about the iPhone or our smartphones as our extended mind. He says, if you take the big picture, the long view from outside, we're outsourcing our cognition to these tools already. So they may not be inside of our tissue, but that doesn't take away the fact that they're a part of us, no different than the termite colony is a part of the termite species. They are our phenotypes. And so we may have a, if we, if we drew the Vitruvian man today and we pointed little diagram arrows at him and we say, oh, this is his frontal lobe, this is his opposable thumb, he'd be holding a smartphone and we would point to it and we say, this is his extended mind. It, it, it's almost like the whole thing is nature. It's all part of the same continuum. It's all made of atoms and it's all unfolding. I mean, we are of nature, so anything that we create, including technology and smartphones, is a part of us. And so by engaging in feedback loops with these tools, it's almost as if thus far evolution has decided that it took less effort to extend our cognitive faculties through the use of this device than it would have to grow an extra frontal lobe to give us like additional mental resources. So it's almost like like we're figuring out ways of doing it smarter. Like it was almost, e it's easier to create an iPhone and store 10,000 emails on it than it would be to grow an extra frontal lobe. Although inevitably, eventually, we will master the information processes of biology and be able to upgrade our biological hardware with the same ease with which, which we engineer these magical devices today. That I think is inevitable. And part of the ongoing human technology co-evolution, the symbiotic relationship. Man has always assimilated his environment and made it a part of who he is. These boats, that opera house, these skyscrapers and towers, these are our extended phenotypes. It's who we are. And when we look at human beings, we shouldn't just look at the naked hominid. We should look at all of these things. And we should point at these things as distinct features of the Homo sapien ecosystem. Or the, the, its own self-created habitat, which is a part of the species. That's what I think. That's awesome, mate. Thank you for chatting to us today. Oh, my God. Well, thank you, Gizmodo Australia. You guys rock. Thanks a lot, man. I hope to see you at the Festival of Dangerous Ideas. Man, I'll be front row. Look All right, man. You're the man, dude. Thanks. Thank you, guys.